Okay, well, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our presentation on the Currency Reference Data Project. Um, so, by way of introduction, I'm BJS Chandel. I'm an executive director at Goldman Sachs and I work within our data modeling engineering team. I'm joined here with my colleague, Elaine Fraser, who's also an executive director at Goldman Sachs and works in the product data engineering team. And we'll also have a video of Silesh Pandey, who is a, an executive director uh, from Nomura, working within the data services team. And together, the three of us have been co-leading this initiative for the past roughly about a year or so um, on trying to build out a currency reference database. Um, so, thanks, Lane. Let's go into the first slide. So, by way of background and how this project came about, Back in early 2020, uh, we were working on the open sourcing of Legend Studio, um, and I myself led one of the uh, FX-based pilots for the open sourcing with the industry uh, through Finos. And what that entailed was analyzing FX option products and their features. And we were trying to essentially develop the ISDA common domain model, which some of you may have heard a little bit about but just very briefly, the ISDA Common Domain Model, or CDM for short, is a blueprint for representing derivatives and their features. And so the idea with the FX pilot was we'll try and use Legend Studio to model different products and their features to enhance the CDM uh, that exists. Now, one of the, I guess, interesting discussion points that came up from that work was regarding currency data and Currently out there in the world, currency data tends to be in a, a string-based format. So obviously you've got USD, GBP, um, and then you have different associated data points to that. So for example, who is the issuing um, authority of that currency? Now, what we felt was that there's perhaps a gap in the data market for currencies. And that then sparked the initiation of this project and Finos kindly connected us uh, to Nomura who have been running a broader securities reference database project. Um, and so we started looking into this. Now, um, the objectives of what we're trying to do here are also, I guess, the benefits um, to the industry uh, from this work. So the first one is standardization. So what we're trying to do is build a model that standardizes different data points associated to currencies. And you'll see more about that uh, later in the presentation from Elaine. Secondly, uh, we want to create a central repository for this. So rather than having to go to different sources and pulling data from different vendors, etc., we're trying to bring it all together so you have a one-stop shop for whatever currency data that you wish to consume. And thirdly, we want to store this in the cloud because we want to make it public. So not only from a data consumption perspective, but also from a contribution perspective. And what we mean by that is we want the industry and participants to basically be able to define the data in a common way, but also work together publicly on the workflow behind that data gets approved and added to this uh, reference database. So with that, I will uh, move to the next slide. And uh, we have Silesh Pandey, who's recorded a video uh, to talk us through the strategic solution and the workflow um, behind how this is all going to work. So here we go. Once again, welcome to the, to the session on currency reference data. Uh, first of all, thank you, Vijay, for, for the great introduction and for setting up this topic today. Vijay and Elaine have been uh, instrumental in shaping up the Currency Re Reference Data Working Group. And together with the wider community, uh, I feel we have come a long way, especially if I look at the way, uh, look at the day when we first spoke about this, about the need for modeling currency reference data. Now, one thing we all agreed was that besides modeling, it would be great if we could uh, maintain the uh, currency web data in a public store, which could then be accessed by, um, by the wider community for uh, and something that could serve as a reference uh, for data comparisons, etc. Now let's take, a, let, let's take a look at what this proposed workflow would look like or what it can do. Um, so at the, at the heart of the design, we'd set a workflow engine uh, which would do all data processing and decision making. 
Uh, let's take a simple use case and then run through this model. So consider a new ISO currency that has been introduced in the market and assume that there are two firms, uh, Nomura and Goldman Sachs, that, that have been considered as uh, data contributors. Now consider a scenario where both Nomura and Goldman Sachs send a request to this ref currency ref master to add the new record. Now let's say that Nomura is the first one to send the record, uh, to send the request. So first, the identity provisioning layer will check whether Nomura has the permission um, to contribute or not. Next, once that validation is successful, the engine will do data validation to ensure that there are no discrepancies. If any critical or mandatory attributes are missing, or if any validation fails, then the uh, engine will send error message back to Nomura, and the request will be queued up for all the contributors to, uh, to review and approve. So basically this step is to bypass validations if needed. Now if however the validation checks are successful, then the engine will uh, create an entry in the cloud store and send uh, electronic confirmation to, uh, uh, electronic notification to all uh, subscribers of this data. In the scenario we just covered, you know, like uh, let's say now Goldman Sachs sends a request after Nomura. The engine will be able to automatically determine that an entry already exists. It will however do a comparison of this uh, incoming record from Goldman Sachs with the entry created by Nomura. And any differences will be uh, analyzed by the engine and it will attempt to determine um, the current value uh, between the two contributors, between Nomura and Goldman Sachs. But let's say if the engine fails to resolve the conflict, because we don't expect um, all entries to be rule-based, you know, so it may not be possible for the engine to resolve the conflict. So in that case, uh, it will post the result for uh, the, the community to approve, uh, to review and approve. Now, that kind of summarizes the way uh, we envision this model to work. Now, Elaine will talk in great depth about the data modeling, but before I hand it over to her, here is a thought for future expansion of this concept. Uh, we would like to use the same concept to model other asset classes uh, under the wider security reference data working group. So to give you an example to illustrate what this future proposal is, uh, let's, let's say when we, when we, let's consider, when we say bond, uh, there's, a, there's an image in our mind, you know, as to what this bond would structurally look like. For, for example, it will have an issuer, coupon, issue date, maturity date, frequency, etc. Now every business function in a bank or, or a financial institution, they, they normally fetch the bond data uh, electronically from their from the web data master. Now, what if we could define a standard object model to represent a bond? Then, none of these IT applications that deal with bonds will have to worry about which attributes to fetch or the uh, difference in uh, or the semantics or the difference in classifications, etc. Of course, there will be a different model to represent different bond types, and um, different functions will have to, uh, you know, will have their own. Uh, own needs or own understanding of what they would need this model to look like. We will obviously capture everything, all the nuances in the design. But fundamentally, this will help create a template which could be used by the issuers in the issuance process to promote standardization. Same thing could be used for uh, for, um, for for structured bond product issuance. You know, so once this objective is met, we could probably deep dive to uh, you know to drive standard classifications. You know, that's the next step. So, on this note, um, I'll conclude my part of the presentation and hand it over to Elaine. Thank you all for, the, for your time, and uh, we all look forward to engage further on this topic. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. So, my thanks to uh, Sanjay. Uh, oh, one second. How do I get? Ah, there we go. My thanks to um, Salesh and to Vijay for the introduction earlier. My name is Elaine Fraser, as Vijay said. I'd like to talk through how we've actually um, devised the model and the process of our working group. So the first thing I'd like to do is show you if this is going to work. There we go. The discussions that we had initially in our working group were around what requirements we had for currency reference data. And we asked the participants, and we had representation from a, um, a large number of groups, we asked the participants for their use cases. And the common theme was that people wanted to be able to have 
the same set of reference data for currency so that it would make it easier to communicate between themselves and regulators and communicate between themselves. Now, this may become clearer when we look at the sorts of things that people wanted in the currency reference data set. So what you're seeing is our draft list of a data dictionary. And you can see that as well as having ISO codes for the currency, we also have an onshore offshore indicator. And we have things like rounding rules. Now, the ISO currency list will tell you the currencies that are actually issued by countries of the world and used as hard currencies within those countries. But there are other things that you need in a trading context that are not ISO currencies. So the example of onshore, offshore that came up very quickly in our discussions is applicable to countries such as China, where the currency that is used internally cannot be used outside the country and a non-ISO currency code is created to cater for that. This also resulted in the need for our item number nine here of vendor codes to be able to actually create mappings between the currency codes used in the ISO list and currency codes used by various vendors or local regulators. So this was our initial list of requirements. And from this, we, we devised our initial model, which has since evolved a little bit, as you can see from the diagram. So the things we were interested in that I've already talked about, we've got at the bottom here, we have a set of non-ISO codes, which would allow us to create mappings from particular issuer data sets, such as, let's say, Bloomberg currency codes back to ISO. We have a data type for rounding, so that we can talk about the precision and the direction of rounding. And we also, as we discussed further, um, realized that there were many more types of issuer than just simple countries. So the ones that we included in our model are obviously countries, but also for things like the euro, we need to be able to cater for treaty organizations. And we also felt, because at the time we were still discussing things like cryptocurrencies and other, um, and other non-standard currencies that may potentially be issued by organizations, that we may need legal entities as issuers. The other thing that came up as we were reviewing the model as well as having an onshore offshore requirement, there was also a question of whether the currency was actually deliverable. Um, so this is something we are going to revisit because we don't think we've completely understood what it means to be deliverable. Um, but the concern was that, for example, for Brazil and for India, you can use their currency inside that country, but if you want to trade that currency, you actually have to do an exchange within the country to another country. Um, so it's not deliverable outside the country. Our next step was to actually look for um, some sample data. So we started with the ISO list. And I think this computer doesn't like my hands because they're too dry or something. There we go. Um, we started with the ISO list, and the ISO list, as you may be aware, also has um, precious metals and test currencies and funds in it. So we started with that, and that gave us our first impression of a currency type. And right at the bottom of this screen, you can see we have precious metal. Um, we then looked in more detail at this, and the ISO list itself has a lot of duplication. So we decided we needed to tidy up this list and make sure that each currency appeared only once. As Salish said in, in, his, uh, in his video, we want to be able to understand uniqueness of currencies. So we needed to do a bit of a tidy up. So we then... We then took the ISO list and we 
took one instance of each of the currencies and we investigated what we understood to be the issuing country of that currency. So we now have a, a single list of currencies and for example, um, Australian dollars, um, euros, um, US dollars are actually mentioned several times in the base ISO list. So we just took one instance of each of those and we assigned the appropriate issuing country to them. And on this list, you can see an example of a treaty organization, which isn't the euro. There are a few more in the world than just the euro, where multiple countries use the same currency. So we have actually put this data um, into Legend Studio. We are um, considering how to store it potentially in the cloud and have it retrievable using, um, using other features of query that are available in the, in the tool. Um, so we have stored it at the moment in memory and H2 in, 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 this, um, in this studio project. Um, we can query it locally, but we want to be able to use the features that Salish was alluding to, allow other people to um, improve the data set for us by adding extra values. And so we haven't actually um, progressed with a physical store for the currencies yet. The other thing we want to do is we want to improve the model. So people have also in our meetings mentioned other things they want to cater for, such as understanding the minor units of currency. So the pence for pounds, the cents for US dollars. So once we have our initial set of data stored somewhere, persisted, and we've um, actually prototyped the workflow that Salish was describing, we hope to then move on and model other things and create new data sets over this model. And on that note, I'd like to hand back to Vijay, who will describe how other people can get involved in this project. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Let's go back to the slide. Okay, yeah, so Final slide, um, just in terms of how you can all get involved and we're obviously uh, keen for more and more participants across the community to you know, take part and contribute to this project. So we run a, um, a fortnightly Tuesday meeting, 10, 10, p uh, 10 a.m. Eastern time, 3 p.m. UK time. Um, so that's open if people wanna, uh, do wanna get involved, definitely reach out. Um, additionally, we do have a mailing list, so you can see it there on the second point, currency-ref-data at spinoff.org for any questions, etc. Um, and of course, the model that Elaine showed within Legend Studio, that is all available to anyone who has an account set up with Legend as well. So if you want to explore that, um, you can do so. And all the discussions and contributions that we're making to the model itself are all done through the Studio platform. Um, and finally, uh, obviously got a, a GitHub um, an issues page as well, where you can uh, point out any particular use cases that you would like the group to consider. Um, and so we'll be continuing to progress with this project. Um, there's still a few moving parts to it, um, but definitely get in touch with us and uh, on the distros that are available there. And finally, I would also just like to give a thanks to Finos who have facilitated uh, this project from the get-go and it's been a, a great experience collaborating with uh, all the other firms that have been involved so thank you everyone i hope you enjoy the presentation and i'll open for questions yeah so in terms of uh, uh, the model itself uh, is the is the expectation this will go back into is the cdm and wherever we are let's say using iso currency would be replaced with this class, new class? So broadly speaking, yes. Um, so right now, the way currencies or currency attributes are represented in the CDM is mostly in a string form. So the idea is, is that with this model, once it's fully built out, you could essentially create a mapping to the CDM and, you know, be able to pass through your data according to the validations and controls that this model will provide for. Um, now, obviously, 
ISDA themselves have been involved in this project as well. So we're ensuring that whatever we are building and what the attributes that we're defining and the standards that we're creating is all in sync with what is expected of the ISDA CDM. So that's the goal that eventually we, we will be able to plug this model into the CDM. Any other questions? Yeah. Going, sorry. So yeah, at the beginning you said that different banks are contributing to this and there's a reconciliation model to decide what goes into the, the your online H2 version, right? But mm -hmm. what if the banks fundamentally disagree about the attributes? They have different views on these different things. Doesn't that compromise the ability for your model to be used in all those banks? Yeah, that's a, a great question um, and one we've thought about to some depth. So the idea is, is that a bank can like contribute any suggestion that they want. And in some cases, it will be fairly straightforward in the sense that, let's say there's a new currency code that's been published out there and everyone accepts it, that bank will contribute it. It should be fairly standard for the community to accept that. Um, for more, I guess, technical or nuanced use cases where there is a certain view from a certain party, um, the current kind of short to medium term kind of uh, workflow that we're thinking of is that suggestion can be brought forward and then the working groups that we currently have set up will be used as a platform to discuss that in depth and come to some sort of mutual agreement across the industry. Uh, in the longer term, as we built out more of the strategic sort of workflow behind this, the idea is hopefully we can somewhat automate that in the sense that, as Silas mentioned in his video, there'll be notifications sent out to the relevant, um, I guess, approvers of the data going into this. Um, and then again, if, if a discussion needs to be had to get more detail, more insights and rationale, then the idea is that we'll meet together to, to have that discussion. Make one more question, yeah. Yeah, so I have a specific modeling question. Um, have you thought about modeling on the full set of currencies as, as an enumeration? This comes up a lot in, in my domain. Uh, it, there's always this like balance between uh, doing it as an enumeration that has advantages, it becomes part of the model itself. So all, those, all that negotiation about what uh, currencies are included mm -hmm. becomes part of managing the code itself. Um, so it's not a data, uh, data set that you have, you have to manage separately. We already have tools to manage the, the code, right? So this has, this has come up. Um, and one of the concerns we had when we were developing the model is, as you saw, there are features of the currencies that are important from a trading perspective, such as whether it's deliverable, um, whether it's the offshore version. If you have an enumeration, you cannot encode that in the enumeration. So when we have talked about this, um, there is a rationale for having an enumeration. For example, as uh, Vijay was saying, if we want to incorporate the list into other things, such as replacing the string in, uh, in the CDM, then that is a good context for an enumeration. But we would still need the full model so that people can interpret the data and understand the trading potential of the data because that list in itself is not sufficient to understand the currencies. Great. Any other questions? Yeah, Norman. Well, Uh, yeah, where do you draw the line? How do you decide what is and isn't a currency? I mean, is it any crypto, any um, commodity could be in there? Or, you know, is the dollar on a, the same footing as Dogecoin or whatever? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll maybe help I you think, out. Um, you want to go first? Yeah, well, I, I was going to pass <laughs> over to you anyway. But I, I, think, I think the driver is what are people actually trading? Um, so, as Vijay said, the, the origin of this project was talking about um, FX derivatives. So, I'll hand back to Vijay now on that thought. <laughs> yeah, so it's 
a philosophical question that, that we've discussed as well in our forums. But um, it's tricky. It's tricky. And I think there's also different understanding across the industry as to what actually is a crypto, you know, from a, a regulatory perspective. I know there's sentiment to view it as a commodity from a business side it viewed as like a, an FX. Others may view it as something else. So in light of, I guess, the, the blurred boundaries associated to, you know, these different possible, um, I guess, underlying assets, um, we've taken a sort of phased approach with the project to try and at least define sort of standard fiat currencies um, as an initial phase and then expand upon that over time and obviously spend the required, I think, uh, level of discussion around those different topics. So, yeah, very interesting question. And I'm hoping by the end of this project, we'll have a somewhat of a clearer view as to sort of, you know, what exactly is a currency versus not. Um, so, yeah, more to come on that. <laughs> All right. Okay. I think that covers everything. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you.